Hey, here we are. Week seven of the Game Show Challenge. We've seen some fun stuff for the last few weeks. We're going to have a great time today. Kendall's message has to do with relationships, and so today's challenge has to do with relationships. And so we pre-picked a couple of couples to be our victims, I mean, to be our contestants today and help us out. So we're going to ask those couples to come on up. Kelsey and Coleman, come on up. Put your hands together. Yeah. <laughs> I know I said you guys didn't have to talk, but just, just real quickly, uh, Kelsey and Coleman Sweden, and how long have you guys been married? Almost four years. You should have paused and let him yeah. see if he could read. No. <laughs> he just said three. All right, you guys go ahead and have a seat. You'll find on the seats a couple of little cards, okay? You got a blue card and you got a pink card. All right, our second contestants this morning is John and Kelly Boland. Come on up. All right. John and Kelly, how long have you guys been married? Almost four years. <laughs> Almost. Hey, we got evenly matched this morning. It is going to be fun. Go ahead and have a seat. And uh, so you've got a blue, a blue fan and a pink fan. And so here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to ask some questions. And the answer to the question is going to be simple and easy. You put up, if it's you, you put up a blue flag. If it's your spouse, you put up, uh, guys, I'm speaking to you, put up the blue Put up the pink if it's your spouse. Ladies, if it's you, you put up the pink. If it's your spouse, you put up the blue. Make sense? Real easy, okay? Here we go. Question number one. Who makes the better breakfast? Ooh, there's a pause over there. All right, John and Kelly gets one point. Good job. Good job. All right, here we go. Question number two. Who has the better singing voice? Whoa, John, John and Kelly again with the match. All right, here we go. Question number three. Who is more likely to make the bedroom their personal laundry basket? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, John and Kelly. Kelly. Mm -mm -mm -mm. All right, here we go. Here we go. Number four, who is the pickier eater? Wow, there we go, there we go. A couple of matches. Good job, guys. All right, we ready? Who is more likely to leave their man or woman cave a mess? Wow, all right, Kelsey and, and uh, Coleman, good job. Here we go. Who fell in love first? Lots of pause and hesitate. Ah, there we go. Good thinking, Coleman. Good thinking there. All right. Good job. All right. Who chose the honeymoon location? Okay. The counselors will be on hand after the service today. Here we go. Who controls the credit card? Bam. Look at that. There we go. Good job. Good job. All right. Who is a night owl? Whoa, there we go. Good job. All right, here we go. This is probably the most fun one. Who is more likely to burn the house down when they cook? Wow, good job, guys. Awesome, good job. You guys have been great contestants today. Hey, for your prizes today, we have the sharing size of M&Ms for you guys to pick and choose from. And uh, it was a tie today, unless I'm, my counting is incorrect. So we're just going to come over here. Col you guys got to pick first. So you have your peanut M&Ms, you have your regular milk chocolate M&Ms, and you have your M&Ms caramel. Peanut M&Ms. Would that be the choice? You I should have done the stick, shouldn't I? There we go. Good job. Thank you, guys. And your choice, caramel or regular? Caramel. All right. Good job. Thank you, guys, for helping out. What a great time today. Hey, Kendall's here this morning. He is uh, pumped up and ready to go to share with us this message today on relationships, and we're excited <laughs> to hear from him. Oh, boy. You, Joe was pretty easy on you guys, I think, from the questions. He could ask some really good ones. <laughs> oh, man. Well, listen, let's all turn in our Bibles here. Let's open up to Colossians. And uh, we're going to be in chapter 3, and we barely get into chapter 4. 
But uh, this has been a whole series called Challenged, okay? A couple things I wanted to mention before I got into the message. Uh, one of those is just remember, I put them out there last week, but we have uh, just some invite cards that you can pick up and put in your purse or wallet or just stick them in your car. And you're always going to be ready to invite anybody to church, okay? And you can just simply give it to them and say, hey, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to Warrington Christian Church this Sunday. And and you can set up whatever you'd like. You might want to say we can sit together or listen, I'll take you out to eat after church, whatever you want to do. But it's a great way uh, to make a connection with some people you know uh, that, that really do need to be in church. Another thing that is uh, brand new today outside, there's a table in the foyer. This is all about life group signups, okay? And these life group signups are going to last all the way through September the 9th. And on September the 9th, I'm actually going to dedicate a message about why small groups. Uh, and we're, we're going to just talk about why you really should be involved in that. But I encourage you to go ahead and, and get signed up. The other thing is in your bulletin is about the Discover Luncheon. If you're newer to the church and you'd just like to meet me on a little more personal basis, I'm going to share just a few things about the church. Uh, I'd love, love to have you sign up and be a part of that. And that will be on September the 9th, I believe, as well. September the 9th. And it'll just be right after church services on that day. Well, it'll just take about, I don't know, an hour, maybe an hour and 10 minutes we'll be here. Well, let's get into to the message today. We've all been, the whole idea is that through this series, that we're definitely going to be challenged, okay? And so sometimes I can be a little more I don't know if we want to call it feisty or whatever, but you know, hey, we'll just, we'll have a good time with it, all right? Well, we'll be reading through the scriptures as we go along, so we will get there. It was a few years back that a 21-year-old young man from California, he bet his friends that he could fit inside a baby swing, okay? And his friends decided to accept the bet. And so he took detergent, uh, you know, uh, laundry detergent. He soaked himself down. He got inside and he squeezed down into the baby seat all the way, you know. And you can just imagine all the laughter going on, right? You know, probably a lot of laughing. But the laughter soon turned to anxiety when the young man discovered that he couldn't get out. And uh, to make matters worse, his friends just left him there. <laughs> and they didn't help. And about 6 a.m. the next morning, the groundskeeper of the park started hearing these screams for help. And, uh, of course, the groundskeeper went over there. He may have been laughing, too. I don't know. But uh, he had to, to call, and uh, the, the firefighters came, and... You know, they looked over the situation. They decided that they would cut the chains and send him to the hospital with the seat still around him, okay? <laughs> and so when they got to the hospital, they used cast cutters to cut it off. All I know is that after going through all that, let's just hope he collected the $100, right? <laughs> let's just hope. Now, what about those friends? Hmm, let's think about that. What kind of friend would leave you stranded in a baby swing all night? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I wonder if he was upset with his friends. From my observation, you know, there's been a lot of ups and downs. <laughs> there can be ups and downs, you know, in, in relationships. But you can only leave somebody stranded so many times. until that relationship is in pretty serious trouble. You see, how you treat people over time plays a major role in whether that relationship is going to succeed or fail. One commentator said, in fact, the arena of relationships is our best testing ground for spiritual authenticity. Thinking on things above, and that's part of what, we had, uh, what I'd taught on you know, a few weeks back, but thinking on things above should lead to practical results below. 
Now from Colossians chapter 3 and starting in verse 18, and we'll go through chapter 4 and verse 1 throughout the message today, but there are three relationships that are addressed here in the text. There's the husband-wife relationship, there's the parent-child relationship, and we're going to look at it as the employer and employee relationship. Now, I think it's very obvious as we read through this text, okay, it's not like it's real detailed about relationships. But I do think that we are going to discover some basic guidelines, we might call them principles, that we can employ in these relationships, and it's going to lead to a relationship having the, the best environment to survive in. So let's go ahead and get started, and we're just going to consider, first of all, the husband-wife relationship. And I want to read from Colossians 3, and I'm going to read verses 18 and 19. It says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Now, you may have heard this, so just laugh along, okay? It'll make me feel good today. But uh, there's a story about this couple, and uh, they had been married for 60 years, and so everybody was wanting to know, you know, well, how is it that you made it through 60 years of marriage? And so the husband, he spoke up and said, well, you know what? When we got married, we made a decision that I would make all the major decisions and my wife would make all the minor decisions, to which at that point the wife took up the tail and said, and in 60 years of marriage, we have never had to make a major decision. Okay. Now, I have my doubts that such an, ar ar an arrangement in a marriage would actually lead to a successful marriage relationship. Many decisions, I think, are best made together. Now, in our text, like I said, it doesn't get real detailed but there are two basic biblical guidelines that every husband and wife must be willing to live, live by if they want their marriage relationship to be successful, okay? And here's the first guideline that we discover, and that is the wife is instructed to submit to her husband. Now, I think the word submit, you know, whenever we say that in our society today, it can be taken very negatively, you know? There's a lot of people out there that would really look down on that and say, no, you don't need to do that. Uh, so ladies, before you start throwing anything at me, all right, just give me a chance to make my point, and then you can throw stuff at me, all right? <laughs> when you actually go back to the original language of the Bible, okay, that word submit or submission, it is the Greek word hupotasso, okay? Now, hupo means, you break it down, it means under... Tasso means to get in line, uh, to get in order, or to arrange yourself, basically. So submission in the Bible, it means to get in order and to line up under something. And so when we place that in a marriage context, it is by God's design, okay, in His Word, that a wife voluntarily places herself under the spiritual direction and leadership of her husband with a willingness that, you know, I, I want to meet his needs. Now, when I say that, okay, it doesn't mean, submit does not mean that uh, the wife is inferior. It does not mean that she is unequal, that she is less valuable, has nothing to say of the matter, or means that, uh, you know, she's supposed to wait on her husband hand and foot. It doesn't mean that. It just means that God has designed an order for the family. There was a guy by the name of Orrin Root, okay? And he wrote this. He said, in the home, as in any social unit, some ultimate authority must exist. This position has been given to the husband and father, but he must see his position not as a throne, nor his authority as a club. He is divinely appointed to carry out a difficult work for which he will be held accountable by the Lord who placed him there. His judgments are to be sober, unselfish, and always made with a first concern for the spiritual and physical well-being of, of his family. Now, I get back to verse 18, and I think it should not be forgotten that in the text that submitting to your husband, okay, 
And whenever we talk about submit, I always like to point out, we're not talking about ladies that you are to submit yourself to every male in the human race. Sometimes I think it's the way it's taken. No, this is all about your husband that you love, that you committed your life to. You are to submit to your husband with this willingness to meet his needs, and you're going to follow, follow his leadership for the family. And what does it say to the, in the text? As is fitting in the Lord. I think we would all agree that marriage is intended to be a very intimate and a very loving relationship. And that's why it's important to understand the next guideline, okay? Because one without the other never leads to a successful marriage relationship. So there are two things going on. We've talked about how a wife is to submit herself to her husband. Let's go to guideline number two. It says the husband, okay, is instructed to love his wife and not treat her harshly. A parallel passage is actually found in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 where it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now we would ask, how much did Jesus love the church? He died for it. And that's to be the extent of love for your wife as a husband. In our text, there is the word translated harsh, okay? I think that's kind of interesting too, how it says, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. It, what the word means is, is uh, it, it, it's the idea of producing a bitter taste in your stomach, you know? Maybe it's kind of like a Taco Bell lunch that's gone bad, you know? Ugh. It's irritating, you know? It's the idea of being sharp. Okay, being cross with someone. And so here's the point, okay? Husbands, you need to love your wife in a manner that displays sacrifice, that displays commitment and loyalty and respect and gentleness and unselfishness instead of treating her harshly in such a way that is upsetting to her stomach. It makes her feel bitter inside. You are irritating, you see, to her. And husbands, when you lead your home with love, guess what? Your wife is not going to have any problem placing herself under your spiritual leadership and direction. On the other hand, men, if you're leading your home with an iron fist, you know, if you're being disrespectful to your spouse, if you are verbally abusing, if you are self-centered, if you are degrading, you're unwilling to pitch in and help, then you're going to make it very hard for your wife to submit to your leadership and direction for the home. In his book, it's called uh, God's New Society, John Stott. I think he said it very well. He said the essence of Paul's instruction is wives submit, husbands love. And these words are different from one another since they recognize the headship from which God has given to the husband. Okay, now listen to what he says. Yet when you try to define the two verbs, it is not easy to distinguish clearly between them. What does it mean to submit? It is to give oneself up for somebody. What does it mean to love? It is to give, up, give oneself up for somebody as Christ gave himself up for the church. Thus submission, he says, and love are two aspects of the very same thing. Namely, of that selfless, self-giving which is the foundation of an enduring and growing marriage. So we think about it, okay? When the wife submits herself to the spiritual leadership and direction of her husband, and the husband shows love for his wife and does not treat her harshly, it will create the best environment for that marriage relationship to survive and succeed. Now let's move on to the second relationship that's talked about in the text here today, and that is the parent-child, parent and child relationship. Let's read from Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 20 and 21. 
it says to the children here, it says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And then verse 21 says, Fathers, some translations may actually leave that out and make it sound like parents. But in the original, he, in the language, he's directly talking to the fathers. I think we can say both parents, but he's really drawing out and concentrating, fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. There are two guidelines, okay? Pretty simple in words, but the first guideline is this. Children must obey their parents because this pleases the Lord. Okay? Now, I'm sure you've read about some weird laws out there, you know. There are some weird laws in, in, in Missouri. For example, in Mole, Missouri. I don't know where that's at. But in their law books, frightening a baby is a violation of the law. Okay? So don't scare any babies there. In Purdy, Missouri, dancing is strictly prohibited. In University City, Missouri, no person may have a yard sale in their front yard. <laughs> I did run across a weird one out of Mississippi, okay? They have a law in Mississippi. Children who disobey their parents can have their hair shaved off. Man, aren't you glad that is not in Missouri? Or we might be having a lot of bald kids walking around church today. <laughs> Instead of disobeying parents, okay, kids, and getting your hair shaved off, God wants every child to actually follow the directions of their mom and dad. Why? Because as the text says, it pleases the Lord. And young people, let's just say, you may not realize it at this point, but when you have parents who are concerned about your life, okay, they're concerned about who you run with. They're concerned about where you go. They're concerned about how late you're staying out. Listen, it is evidence that those parents love you deeply. And they have your best interests in mind. Parents like that, you see, you are wise to listen to what they have to say. Here's the second guideline then. Parents, and especially fathers, should stay away from the kind of, of criticism, harassment, and belittling that breaks a child's spirit. I'm just going to read a couple other translations. Uh, the New American Standard Translation says of that verse 21, Do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. Uh, the contemporary English version reads, Parents, don't be hard on your children. If you are, they might give up. The J.B. Phillips translation reads, Fathers, don't overcorrect your children or they will grow up feeling inferior and frustrated. Now, we've got to say that undoubtedly, okay, I mean, parents, you know, kids, they're going to test you. Uh, they're going to rebel against you. Uh, they're going to try your patience. And on such occasions, they do need to be disciplined. But the discipline that we use should be balanced instead of it's too rigid or it's too permissive, okay? You get it? It's like two different extremes. Too rigid, too permissive, somewhere there needs to be a balance. And so to use a form of discipline that actually makes your child feel embittered inside, uh, that they feel frustrated, exasperated, that they feel like they're just being harassed, belittled, made to feel inferior, and they're on the verge of giving up of thinking that they could ever please their mom and dad. That's the kind of discipline you need to stay away from. I like what Gary Weedman wrote. He said, the goal of parents, especially fathers, is to treat their children in such a way that they might develop a positive and confident attitude about themselves their abilities, and their world. Of course, discipline is necessary for this to happen, but it must be a discipline tempered with love and respect for them as human beings and as gifts from God, okay? So, here's the deal. When the child fulfills their responsibility in the Bible to obey their parents, and the parent 
especially the dad has pointed out, fulfills their responsibility to stay away from the kind of harassment, criticism, and belittling that makes the child, you know, it's breaking their spirit. You're going to have the best environment for the parent-child relationship to succeed. Let's go to the last relationship addressed in the text here, and, and that is the master employer, the master slave, only we're going to relate it as the employer and employee relationship. It was uh, back a few years, back in 2010, that uh, police reported that a 32-year-old man, his name was Michael Yarborough, okay, he was like back at his job, you know, the first day back, he had been on leave from a broken leg, and it was his first day back, and he was, you know, stocking shells uh, in, in the baby area. Uh, and uh, as he was stocking shells, a female supervisor came up, you know, and, and started questioning the kind of job that he was doing. And so he made some kind of snide remark back, you know, and, and, and the supervisor said, shut up. And the 32-year-old young man said, you're just lucky that we're on the clock. And she said, well, what are you going to do, hit a girl? He said, yes, and he punched her in the face. She fired him on the spot, and he left the store. Hmm. I would say both of those employees probably needed to hear <laughs> these next few verses, okay? We're going to start in verse 22, and I'm going to go through chapter 4, verse 1. Slaves, or we might say employees, obey your earthly masters and everything and, and do it. Not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, or we would say uh, employer, provide your slaves, employees, with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. The workplace relationship here gives a couple of guidelines again. There's, there's two of them to point out. One of them says, okay, that as employees, we really should obey the boss. Okay? Obey the boss. And, and it kind of defines it pretty well out there, doesn't it? It says obey them in everything now i would think okay now everything as long as it's not violating the word of god or some kind of unethical practice okay i don't think we're called to obey that just because our you know boss said to do it it also says do a good job whether they're they're watching you or not but it's the idea of you need to do a good job out of what does it say out of reverence for the lord you need to use the same, the same work ethic that you would whether your, your boss is standing right next to you or whether they're gone for the whole week, you know? And then it also points out that you need to give your best effort as though you were working for the Lord. Well, that kind of puts it all in perspective, doesn't it? I mean, to work as though you're working for the Lord. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't seem like you're working for the Lord. <laughs> But we're to do it as though we were working for the Lord. And it is true. Listen, I, I've known people, your boss may not treat you very well. And you think there are things that have been unfair. But just know that there is a master in heaven who is going to reward your integrity on the job and your sincerity and your hard work. The second guideline is that employers must treat their employees, it says, with justice and fairness. Now, if you're in a position, okay, and you're the owner of something, you're the manager, maybe you're uh, uh, the lead, uh, you know, the, the shift leader, 
or you're possessing any kind of authority over people that you would lead, you really need to tr treat those who work under you, it says, with justice and fairness. And so we kind of look at the opposite then, to be disrespectful to those who are under your leadership, to be abusive or completely unfair to your employees or those working underneath you, that would be wrong. And as Paul indicates, you... As the leader, you need to remember that you have a master, the ultimate employer in heaven. And he shows no favoritism. And he is going to be the one who will reward you accordingly. So let God, you see, be the role model for you as one who is just and one who is fair. So again, hey, when the employee fulfills their responsibility of obeying their boss and the boss fulfills their responsibility to treat their employees with justice and fairness, it will create the best environment for those relationships and work environment to really succeed. I think Paul points out some things real quick to the folks here at the church at Colossae but they're just some great principles that we need to think about in our relationships that we have in this life. Let's bow our heads and pray as we get ready for our decision time today. Dear Heavenly Father, you know out there in life, God, there's, there's a lot of relationships that, that we have. And Lord, uh, it is not always easy to work with people. It is not always easy to... Uh, to serve with people or uh, God it's not always easy being being the kid you know the child it's not always easy being the parent it, it's not always easy being the husband or being the wife and God I, I know that all of us here have gotten some things wrong at one point or another and I thank goodness for your forgiveness but Lord I, I just pray that that we're gonna look to your word in that we're going to seek to go forward and do relationships your way because it will create the best success. Father, I pray for anybody here that needs to be making a decision today. May your Holy Spirit speak into their life and guide them to the change they need to make. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think it's good to remember that, you know, our relationships need to be lived out under the guidance and direction of God's Word. Uh, we had uh, in our uh, Bible study time this morning with adults, uh, we talked quite a bit about love, you know, and they're really about the kind of behavior that we ought to have in, in relationships. And and we've talked about that this morning in a, in a different way. But listen, whether, you know, when it comes to the husband-wife relationship, I just hope you can resolve to say, you know, allow God's word to guide me. When it comes to the parent-child relationship, that you're just willing to say, hey, allow God's word to guide me. And when it comes to the employer-employee relationship, well, allow God's word to guide me. We're having our decision time, and there's going to be a few people in the back. I'll be back there too. And listen, if you just need some prayer today, you come on back. If you need to uh, just have somebody to talk to a little bit about something going on in your life, man, you come back. If you need to make a decision to follow Jesus, or you just want to, look, want to know a little more about it, you come back there. If you've already made a decision to follow Jesus, and you've already been baptized in His name, and hey, you're ready to place your membership with the church, then you come on back and, and we'll talk about that too, all right? Let's stand and let's sing our decision song today.